Starting now. Perfect. Well, good evening, everybody in uh, watching land. We're going to watch this video <laughs> maybe later. Um, I was just commenting to Adriana and Kate how it's interesting how maybe it just talks about my reach and our reach of how the Spanish group is like super mega active with 45 or more people joining. Adriana's been there. It's it's like a complete different yeah. thing. Um, and maybe it's the Hispanic culture of they, they like to get in the crowd and they miss their crowds and something. I, I don't know. Or, or the others are just really busy. So um, the numbers are definitely three to one in terms of people who expressed interest in the Spanish version and, and the English version. So um, regardless, this week, let's just have a little bit of a conversation among us and then we'll see if Daniela or someone shows up as well because she's been showing up every week um, about professional educator and um, I think part of what we're doing of running something like open flip talks about this um, I kind of broke my own rule included at my own post in the list of readings for this week because I don't really like to link my own stuff but we had Martha Ramirez last Thursday and it was really, it was a really great session. Martha's amazing. Um, and she just showed so many cool tools and games she's built and things. And I commented that um, all of her work of her games that we, she was showing last Thursday is Creative Commons. And mm -hmm. she's got Creative Commons licenses on everything. And, and since I'm like a Mr. Open Source and Open Education and Creative Commons kind of guy, I had to point that out and talk about that. And then I thought, well, yeah, that's actually an interesting topic I should bring up more when I'm talking about this pillar of being a professional educator. Um, how we all love to get free stuff and go look for free stuff, but we should all be also contributing to that mm -hmm. content of free stuff to the commons. So um, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, but maybe it's because the last time I gave the course was four years ago and I was like in a different planet. Um, that, that much longer ago, <laughs> yep. literally. So, what what are what are both of your thoughts? What about you, Kate? Why? What has your thoughts been about professional educator over these years? Well, it, it, it's the value of the network. Um, it's the the value of this notion of of better together, and and mm -hmm. that even as educators, we're always learning. We're not complacent. So, you know, being professional educator means, you know, not only are you conducting yourself in a professional manner and, you know, you're, you're being professional, like you're not, you know, in your nose in person. Like, oh, no. Oh, well. <laughs> but it also means like, it's your job to be an educator. So, yeah. you know, always trying to improve, never being complacent, wanting to learn. Like, I mean, that's a, big piece of it and how you model that for your students is important whether it's the giving of feedback or connections but it's modeling that curiosity modeling that process of learning modeling that ongoing learning you know that's all of it yeah Daniela's just joining we're already recording Daniela we've got started um I gave a little bit of thoughts on unprofessional educator and um so did Kate. And, and I like mm -hmm. what you said, Kate, about modeling for our students. I think that's really important. And one thing I've talked a lot about for our students, how we have to model this practice, model that we're always learning. And we didn't just learn what we learned in university and then stopped. Um, and then I've thought more about I need to model more for my colleagues because I, I keep telling them, you got to get on Twitter. There's lots of stuff there, but they, do, they don't understand it without me showing them what the power is of you know I, I had a question and I reached out and then within seconds I have an answer I mean often when we're doing one of these sessions I can do it live um, I'm doing a seminar and I, I tweet out something on Twitter and someone answers um, obviously I have to talk about the fact and, and Alec Koros called me out on this once that I've curated my followers and the people I follow on Twitter for years and years and years. So if I send something out, it's different than if someone who just joined Twitter and still is barely an egg and they send something out and nobody answers because they're just shouting into the void. Um, so again, you gotta be careful about it. 
it's the Cultivating. value of the connection and having a good connection. So, and you don't have to, like, whereas you've spent years and I've spent years and, we, you know, that we have our, our networks curated, those people that we bring into the fold don't have to go through the same process that we did because all they need to do is go look at who we follow and mm -hmm. who follows us and then they can just go right down the list and go follow, 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 follow. And, then and that's it's, super it's, important, you know, showing them what, what the process we go through when we decide whether I do I want to follow this person, let's go look at their feed. And I start reading their feed and seeing what they're doing, what they're following, what they're doing, and I make a decision whether I want to follow that person or not. That's a really good point, Kate. And that, that it's on us as well for some of these people that might have just joined Open Flip and this, this Flip Learning Group lately, that when we see something they post that we're amplifying them and and pointing out their work and replying to their work. I think that's also really powerful. I remember getting so excited when, when an Aaron or a John or, or a Kate Baker would, would put a heart on my tweet or something and, oh my God, and then they follow you and then they unfollow you and then they follow you back and you get all excited. So, yeah. There's a, a tweet from John Bergman that, um, it's on my other computer. I would screenshot it. Um, but it, it was like kind of in the earlier days of flipping for me, but you know, being part of the chat and being connected and going to flip cons and stuff, uh, Bergman actually like tweeted at me and like replied to me and like said, you know, so many words, like I do great things. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> Bergman said, Bergman said, I do a good job. I got a good, I got a good job. I got a good job. Everybody. Oh, Girls, like, come and look at this. <laughs> yeah, he saved it. Like, you know, just to of have course. that value. I was like, a rock star. Did I'm good. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> it's true. And I know Adriana's had that. I mean, she, I, we, we just lost Ken Robinson. And, and I know that Ken replied to one of her. Yeah. <laughs> and so she's got that saved. Yeah. And Neil Gaiman, the author. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. replied to, to one of my tweets when I I was tweeting about how my students were going to read a short story by him and he liked the tweet. Nice. <laughs> so I, he just liked it. He didn't reply, there, but Ken Robinson did. He replied. There's a, um, a really good story. I'll, I'll post it later, but um, Amy Burval, I don't know if you know of her work, but um, she, she does some really good work um, about history and um, she made some music videos where she'd remake popular music videos but change all the lyrics and to teach history and, oh. and they're, they're awesome Amy's awesome so um, um, what you're talking about like the two yeah, and, um, uh -huh. and yeah. she and she made a story for my friend Alan Levine not Adam Levine everyone confuses them with that <laughs> um, and she made a story because Alan has this site called Stories of Connections, Amazing True Stories of Openness. Here, I'm just bringing it up here. Now, see if I can find it. No, I can't find it. I'll find it later. But she talked about the fact that she would do this on Twitter. Um, she would do a reading or they'd be talking about an author in their class. And she was talking about the power of the back channel with students and we, how we should teach students how to use a back channel, whether it's publicly visible or not. And they were using Twitter as well as like a back channel to discuss uh, a story and they would, you know, tweet about it. And then the author, you know, would reply there and the students just like it blew their minds. Um, and, and it's such a wonderful story. And, and it gets back to what you're saying, Kate, about how we use the back channel so much. Um, when we're in some of these sessions, often the chat just explodes and there's this massive amount of content that goes by in the side channel of the chat in our conversations. And I've been working really hard to bring that to my students, um, how to use the chat effectively and not just, it always has to be the webcam or open your microphone to talk to me. They, could, they can communicate through the chat and there's other ways, whether it's a public message and everybody sees it or a private message to the teacher in the chat, I think is really powerful now that we're doing this online. Um, so yeah, I just remember Amy Burbo. I'll find the link here. You know, seeing the evidence 
of like what, like speaking in the back panel. So when I go to conferences, um, we could actually be in person at a conference, you know, and sitting mm -hmm. in a session, I might be on my computer or on my phone accessing that back channel. So like, while I'm not making eye contact to the presenter necessarily, that doesn't mean though that I'm not engaged because I'm still like, I'm communicating. I may be communicating with other people, but it's, um, you know, signal moving off then, you know, and now a lot of times we might call out though our students for like, oh, you're on your phone in class, but in, in nine times out of 10, they probably are playing a game and doing something that they're not supposed to be doing in class. But, you know, being able to teach them and model and say, okay, I'm not playing games on my phone when I'm in a meeting, I'm utilizing a chat or I'm, I'm doing you know, research to pull something up and then can post a link, you know, somewhere for people to see it. Um, so it, it also goes to the definition of like, with professional, being a professional educator, what is the behavior of a professional educator and how can that behavior be interpreted and even misconstrued? Because if I'm sitting on my phone, it looks like I'm not engaged and it looks like I'm distracted. And really, I'm not. Oh, you're mute. You're not coming through anymore, Ken. Oh, there. I, just, I, I hardware muted because I was typing. Um, but it's, I see you do that. And I, I don't think twice about it because I know you. I trust you. I've sat beside you with flip cons and we're both tweeting like mad on our phones. <laughs> and me on my laptop and the phone at the same time always. You, you won normal. awards. You won awards for tweeting, Ken. <laughs> Kate beat me. <laughs> <laughs> but, or, or myself right now, what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to bring up um, the 10 true stories of open openness that was shared by Amy Burval. I, I just shared this with you, uh, but I'll link this out uh, when I share the video of today's session. And this is from my friend, um, Alan Levine, who has a collection of stories. I don't know if it's still open, but various friends of mine that I know, um, there's uh, Rajiv, and I'm in here somewhere, there's Howard, and a bunch of people, there I am. And um, it's this wonderful set of stories of people saying how the fact that we share in the open and we do things in the open leads to amazing things. And, and the story I tell um, was how I met Alan and, and I met Alan through, I don't know, it was a long set of stories and then I ended up going through FlipCon and it's this long series of things, which goes back to, you know, being in grad school in the 1990s and meeting someone from Mexico. And all of these things just kind of domino effect to the fact that I ended up here. Mm. Um, and because I'm sharing in the open or that John brought me to Australia to, to talk about FlipCon or these people that I have no clue who they were from Korea invited me to come talk. And I thought, well, who are these people? And why are they contacting me? I haven't written a book or anything famous, but I'm just open and visible. And they saw me and they thought, well, we could invite this guy from Mexico to come to Korea. And, and I did, and it was good. And I met a bunch of people there and, and still, still follow them and still are in touch. So I think um, now that I think of it, the openness thing for me is really a big part about my um, being a professional educator and, and paying things forward a lot. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Daniela. I'm glad you made it again. How are you? Fine, fine. I hope my internet connection works today. Yeah. Mm. That's <laughs> what you blipped out last time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what were your thoughts before we before it happens and we lose you? Hopefully not. Uh, well, now talking about professional educator, I was um, I was thinking about um, the time that we invest um, as educators. That um, we need, for instance, when, when we organise some flipping, um, that the workload that it takes is, is a lot. Uh, I hope, as I am starting on this. I hope that this is going to be um, less as time goes by. Uh, I think that once uh, you've got things more or less organized, 
on a certain course, then it might be a question of changing some things or updating or adapting to uh, a new course or a new group, or different things. But well, if you've got the basis already, then, but now that we, we haven't had the time to think much about that, I, I am finding myself with a lot of work um, to plan, to record, to design, to organize, to check. I mean, so, and I feel that students are having this workload as well. Um, so I think that well, this part of the professional educator, um, I, I associate it directly with it, with a workload. That is, it's a lot of work to do it um, consciously, to do it well, to try to do it thoughtfully. Um, is very demanding. Uh, but also, we have to think that that's going to have an impact on students as well. So a lot might not be um, good <laughs> just because it is a lot. Uh, so, well, that, that's what, what I thought about it, right? Yeah, that's the workload that it implies to plan, to organize, to um, record, to design, to think, to uh, see how you're going to manage, how you're going to lead students into uh, the, the course and, and how you're going to accompany them as well. So, well, it's twice as much. Today I'm planning what I'm going to do and, and recording the things for next week but also checking what students have done last week and also accompanying and answering things of what they got this week. So <laughs> it's a mess with the flexibility as, as well, right? So sometimes I, I find myself checking things that I asked them to do about, you know, two months ago. Um, and, and, and it's fine. Students, I mean, if they get to the, uh, to the end of the year uh, with all things accomplished, it's going to be all right. But I find myself like in a turmoil at times. Um, so I will. I think that eventually that gets organized. I hope. <laughs> it does. You, you build some like mental muscle memory. So, mm. you know, think, think back to the first time you recorded a video, mm. like and how long that took of a process. So then every time from here on, you're not starting from square one. Mm -hmm. You're able to start from like square five and then square mm -hmm. 10. So mm -hmm. now, like if I'm going to make a video, like I know, I know my process. I have a title slide. I go to slides. Okay. Have my other tabs open, hit record, boom, done. Right. Switch between things, hit pause. Like <laughs> you learn tricks of the trade, but it mm -hmm. does require that level of investment. Mm -hmm. um, and it may take a little bit of time to see that payoff because you're so caught up in the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the time, the time is important. I think it's more, it's the willingness to take that investment to try something new and do that. Cause in the end later, I, I don't think it's more work to do flip, but I want to kind of um, not, send that message that it is more work to do flip. It's just the, the work right. changes. Mm -hmm. And, and just like anything, you teach a new class you've never taught before. And it's always much harder. It's always mm -hmm. way more work than if mm -hmm. I'm teaching that math 101 class that I've been teaching for 23 years where I can just, you know, just stroll into class and have a conversation and I'm, I'm going to be good. Um, mm -hmm. it, but definitely that, that thought of doing something different and going out of our comfort zone Mm -hmm. It's really, really important. What about you, Adriana? What are you thinking about? The fact that we're like, today's a holiday in Mexico and, and it's mm -hmm. evening for everybody else. Um, and, and here we are talking about flip learning. Oh, well, I'm, I've been having a, a, a different experience because it's my first time having just one student. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's very different because because you have to really change things if they're not working for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, when you have a group, you, you can adjust little things for, uh, you, you can stay on your main, on your main idea and then attend specific problems or needs for each student. But, but you can mostly keep track of, of the same thing but last week i was um i was checking uh my students homework and i found out that she's 
very good writing Spanish. Uh, but she can she can read and she can she can read and understand and and write Spanish, but she doesn't have that good skills listening or or speaking it. So I had to change the whole approach and now I've been working on that and it's just one student and I've never experienced that. So so speaking about uh flexibility um, and and being a good teacher that's that's what I'm into this week like I had this plan for me to work with her and now I found that that all the all the things that I've been planning are about writing and and that's a, a competence that she already has so I have to change everything <laughs> So yeah, I don't know if you guys have worked with only one student. It's it's for me. It's a game changer. I'm gonna share something right here right now because I just shared it actually, um, mainly because I was thinking about it. But then you led to it as well, um, Adriana. So this tweet came out today or yesterday from Brenna Clark Gray up in um, uh, Thompson Rivers University in in British Columbia, and that we're still early in this term. But and basically she's going in to say it's always okay to reset and we've been running in panic mode and maybe we didn't do things perfectly but we can take a pause and then make a change make an introduction like she says here about how um you you might have meant to send that introductory video and talk about yourself for your students but you didn't do it because you were busy and you're trying to figure out this new canvas system and zoom and all these other tools <laughs> But you could just do it now. Take a break now that you, you feel you're ready for it. Take that time to do this now. Or maybe what you planned isn't working and, and you sit down and talk with them and you're vulnerable and you're saying, look, you know, maybe what we're doing isn't working and we should rethink about how we're going to do this together and, and kind of have that pause. And I, I kind of had a bit of that pause with my class yesterday, actually. And, and I think it's really important to have this, both the reflection and and being vulnerable and, and allowing our students to direct us in the right direction, I, I think is a really um, scary thing to do, but it's also a really good thing to do. Yeah. So I, well, I like that story. In, in this context, uh, we are all trying our best and, and students as well um, are trying to um, find themselves in this new uh, learning style. So that, that we were pushed. It's it's not always the same. I mean, it's not the same if you if you enroll in a course that is that is flipped, that is online, that is uh, that if, if you were not planning to have an online course. And so it's a lot of changes for, for all of us. So yes, of course. I think that we, we need to help our students focus and, and students need to help us focus as well. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we realized something like that in the course. In the first part of the, in the, first part of the year, when they, all, the, all of this started in March, um, we realized after about two or three weeks that we were doing a lot of things and our students were overwhelmed uh, by the situation, by the amount of material, the amount of things that they had to, to hand in, to do on the, in one platform or in the other. So, uh, well, yeah, we had to stop, say, okay, well, um, we realized that it's a lot. So we're going to have two weeks without homework so that you can catch up and we can read and check things. <laughs> and and we are, yeah, um, we need to do that. Yeah, it's it's all right. I think it's all right. Yeah, we, we kind of get that break right now. Our, our semester system is in our new plan that we started last year. We don't have a full 16 week semester. It's a five week period chunk. And the class might end in those five weeks. It could be just a five week course. Um, the one I'm teaching actually, it's a break. They have what we call Semana Tech, the week of tech where they do something else. They could be doing um, course planning. They could be thinking about um, how they're doing. They could be taking yoga classes. There's all sorts of things they do in this one week. And then we go back the week next week. And so this is, we're kind of in this reflective break right now for, for our period in our university. So I guess I've been thinking about it a lot as well. And I'm really liking that, that, that we have the semester broken out this way. Really cool. 
What's Kate thinking? Well, I, I think it's a, you know, being reactive versus proactive, you know, when, when we looked at the spring and, and the shift to online learning and distance learning, it was, we were being reactive and um, trying to make things work. And when you're being reactive and trying to make things work, it's, you know, you're going with plan A and then maybe plan B, C, but there's not a lot of time to evaluate it and to, and to have that, re that reflective space because you're so in the mode of like going and we have to do this and get this done. So I, I think these breaks, um, you know, teachers in the States often get a bad rap because we go on summer break and we only work <laughs> 10 months out of the year. Well, do you know how much we work in those 10 months? And honestly, oh, yeah. <laughs> And, and, the and that they don't stop. Right. <laughs> and, they and during the summer. Have they watched flip class chat? <laughs> right. Like we're still working every, and I, it was such a hard thing for me to even be able to turn off at the end of the day. Yeah. But when we give ourselves these, these spaces and maybe it's a mandated like break that you're on right now, it allows for that breathing room where we can like step back and look at the process, look at the landscapes, mm -hmm and now reflect, evaluate, and make some changes to be proactive instead of mm -hmm. always reactive. And we need and to value that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when we're always so busy doing everything, all the 10, things. 10,000 RPM. Right, like there's no time then to, to say, okay, let's plan, let's do some design thinking about this. So like Daniela, that you are doing, you know, your videos this week for next week's class, like that's awesome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> awesome. yeah. yeah you're ahead <laughs> yeah because not a lot of times i was like the day before i gotta make a video for tomorrow oh i gotta or make that morning I'm getting up at five <laughs> so i can get this <laughs> yeah i was thinking about that in... some of those <laughs> unshaven videos of ken because he woke up at five and he came down and made his video for his students <laughs> yeah um definitely and, and that's another thing I like about our degree program is that we have this five weeks, then a week off, and then five weeks, a week off, and a five weeks. That last week off, which we call week 18, Semana de Siocho, um, that's purposely made for that. The students sit for that week and they reflect on how they did the semester, um, what they advanced in, what they did well, a whole reflective process for the entire week, and then looking forward into the next semester. And it's really wonderful. I've participated um, in three or four of those because I've, I've done like makeup ones of them because of students that didn't do it on time, had to do it later. Um, and I love that process. And, and so we do that. And, and I think about how we need to reflect. And, and I like that we're teaching our students early in their degree program, how this reflection process is really important. Um, no one did that for me. Mm -hmm. oh, someone's coming in. One of the girls are coming in. <laughs> it's okay. I won't name names on video. Oh, there comes, there comes uh, animals too. Awesome. It's a bingo card yeah. win. Yes. Yeah. Uh, remember, remember a few years ago when that video went viral, the guy that was giving an on interview CNN or whatever, about, yeah. about Korea and the kids. Now we're all done. <laughs> oh, totally. Um, I, I don't think it's a good video session if someone doesn't have a cat on the video. I had a had a volunteer one because I volunteer for the Canadian consulate here in Guadalajara, and they organized one. It was it was nice, but yeah, a cat showed up, so I, she was apologist, and I said, "No, no, this is good. This is this is how it works. We're all at home. We're not even working at home. We're living at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome, exactly. exactly. Yeah, and to and to connect it to the subject um, that's we have to rethink what it is to be a, a, a professional educator right we we have been thought at least in our, in our institution where where i used to work and can still works that they teach us to be like this institutional perfect uh robots <laughs> i don't know you you know what i mean ken they 
they promote. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think it's just our institution. I think it's in so many places. You can see on Twitter where people are freaking out because they gave my kid an absence because he didn't turn on his camera, but he can't turn on his camera because his webcam's not working and, and our internet went out and, and all these things. And I ran into that with my son the other day and I still have a pending conversation with someone about that. But, um, but yeah, we... Yeah, so we, we have to, to be rethink forgiving and, and it's like Kate was talking about she grabs her phone and I don't think anything of it and I'm thinking she's looking for that tweet that she was thinking about because um, that's what we do all the time but that's also because we have a relationship and yeah, we, do. we have an understanding and this is like normal behavior for us mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. the other thing too is like like changing the definition of what is a, a a professional educator it's yeah, like it, it's also looking at what is the behavior of our students and what's you know what's acceptable and not and in adjusting and being flexible with that like yeah you know just because my webcam is on or off doesn't mean i'm i'm more or less engaged in the lesson mm -hmm. it may actually be because oh my internet is unstable and i'm trying to better. save some bandwidth yeah mm -hmm. right so again, how do we validate what's happening in our classroom spaces? Um, how do we validate the learning that's going on? And it's not always going to be the traditional signals that we're used to of yeah. like, yeah. I'm engaged. Yeah, yeah right. What, what is <laughs> like, engagement? It doesn't work it, that I, way. Bonnie, Bonnie Sahoviak on Teaching on Higher Ed podcast shared, um, there was an interview with Dan Levy I think he's at Harvard. Yeah, I think he's a Harvard economics professor, but he just wrote a book called How to Teach with Zoom, and I tweeted out about it. Um, and the Spanish version is available for our Spanish listeners. Um, but he's talking about those five different signals that students can provide while they're connected in one of these synchronous sessions, and we can't just focus on the one. And we need to be really cognizant of, um, I mean, you commented, Kate, that I had a noisy house, and I do right now because I got all these other people around me. And we might have asked a student a question and then we call them out and say, well, what's your answer, Kate? And, and you totally missed it because your internet blipped or your mom's on top of you for doing the dishes or your dad as well. And then like all these other things that could be happening and we need to not assume that, well, you weren't paying attention to me and you weren't engaged with the conversation because there's all these other things going on at the same time that we can't control. And I have like the webcam, I'm using the webcam on the laptop here. Yep, but you but, can look and over there. And then I also have, I have a, <laughs> another, another monitor. Computer there that you can look for stuff. Right, and it's a bigger screen. Yep. So I try to like, like just the little small stuffs on this. So yep. oftentimes like the webcam's picking me up though and I'm looking over here because and I'm reading Kate's stuff. Kate's totally not paying reading. attention. <laughs> I actually like, talked with my students about this, about the advantages of having a second um, computer. I can't imagine teaching right now on just the laptop with one screen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm always part. in front of at least two. Um, and I have this advantage where I can, I'm here, I'm looking at Twitter, I'm watching the channel of what's going on. I might see something come across while we're having a conversation, looking at my notes, my student mentioned something, I'm searching so I can find something to share with them in the chat and using all the channels. But it kind of gets back to what we were talking about, Kate, of like modeling how we do that and why that's valuable. Because I yeah, was in, in, in a session and in last any case, year and I got called on it. Yep, go in ahead. In any then, case, how, how many devices do you need? Mm -hmm. Imagine. <laughs> in my case, it, it's impossible <laughs> because I just have um, one computer. Now I, yeah. I'm on the iPad, which I usually use, right? Yeah. So I can have the iPad and the, um, and the computer. That's true. Uh, but in many cases in my house, Nobody I've got does. two uh, teenagers uh, in, yeah. in class and they need the computer to how many devices would I need um, to have all the setup? Maybe if I, if I could be, or if I decide that I'm going to be teaching online, um, for longer periods, not just during the quarantine. Well, maybe, but still, I would have to invest a lot. Not yet. I mean, not institutions, yet. that's another thing that I have been complaining a lot here. That is, no institution has provided any kind of device 
for anybody. I mean, for yeah. students or for teachers. And yeah, we are yeah. doing things and, and, and things break because they are yeah. turned on 24 yeah. hours a day and we have to pay from our salaries to repay them <laughs> and we door. still worry about not losing um, classes yeah. and still being there for our students somehow even on an iPad. Uh, so imagine on the iPad I could not have on the um, iPad it's the, the really mess to try and change like, the screen or anything. This it's book talks about that. In the first chapter, Daniela, this book talks about that. It's really well done that it says, these are the essentials you need to be able to do synchronous teaching with Zoom or any other tool similar. And then these are like nice to have things below. And and mm -hmm. having a computer is like kind of at the top, like trying of to course. do these classes with a phone or, a, or mm -hmm. an iPad or something is just um, because you can't, I've got it set up so I can see all my students here while I'm sharing what I'm sharing over on the other monitor. No. And if you don't have that set up, when you share, all of a sudden you can't see everyone. Well, the exactly. ones that have the I can never see or the everyone. chat I can or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the other thing you bring up with um, like equipment and teachers having to shoulder and that burden of purchasing the items and, and think and about how everything. much money spent we've spent for like supplies uh -huh. for our own classroom feeding our own students like so professional educator yep i think isn't just something for us internally like how we behave it yep. also needs to be how non-educational world sees and treats us yeah. because in the corporate environment you don't pay for squat your business gives you everything and compensates you and yes. you expect Teaching is the only profession where, pe where, where, where people steal stuff from their home to bring to the office and not vice versa. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and so like professional educator, like that's something that we need others to be seeing us as yeah. and treating us like professionals because we haven't been treated like right. that, to be honest. At, at that one time I went back to the office, I think it was May. I've been back twice since we've been in quarantine for six months. And I thought, I'm going to grab some printer paper. And I was kind of sort of feeling guilty about it. But I'm like, no, I, I need some printer paper because I'm like working and I'm doing stuff. And sure, my kids are printing some of the stuff and some, but, but why should I feel guilty about grabbing some printer paper while I'm here at the office? Like, no. So yeah, it's, it's. Or, you know, all the yep. books we buy and everything. Oh, we lost Daniela again. No, no, here I am. I am. Oh, go ahead. Good. No, I'm, I'm glad. I, I was checking. You were still there in the participants, but your screen blipped. But yeah, all the books we buy. And, you know, I just bought this book about how to teach on Zoom because Bonnie Stahoviak, who talked about it on Teaching Higher Ed, which is a podcast about education that I listen to. And, you know, all of these hours add up and, and it's part of being. The word profession is, is it's not a job. It's a profession. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if to. you work if if you work for um if you work for a company now people who are um in home office okay. take the com they cut the the computer from the company if you're in business I mean you haven't got and and I I said that um at university yeah. in a meeting last week I said I don't want a computer that does any other thing but being connected to the campus from the university. That's yeah. the only thing I want. So if you want me, if you want to give me a computer that once I started, I just get into the university campus, for me it's fine because that's the only thing I want. So yeah. they will. Um, they tricky. said they were, they were going to, to think about it, at least. And Kate has that cool perspective now because she's, she's left the classroom and she's been out yeah. of it. So she, I think we talked about that the other day, Kate, how, how your mindset I, I, about work has changed. It, it's totally different. And now that I'm like outside of the classroom and able to see this, like I, now granted I work for an educational technology yeah. company, so I'm still in education and I'm still yeah. using a lot of my educator skill set. but you're right. Like the computer that I'm using that was provided by the company. Um, you know, the equipment I'm able to expensify that, um, you know, and there's, you know, if I were in the office and not working remotely, there would be perks 
you know, right. like snacks were always mm-hmm. provided in the office. Like there was free water machine. Like, yeah. like there's stuff like in my you know, office, teachers. we bring our own coffee maker and our own coffee so we can make coffee. I mean, I, I'm lucky. I have a laptop provided by my university, but most of my colleagues no. don't, right? The ones no, of us, no. Atlanta, <laughs> the ones that are like full-time right? professors, we have it provided, but ones that are, um, are sessional teachers don't. They're my, like my wife, um, we bought her laptop so she could teach. Um, and it's but even, the same goes for the internet connection. I mean, oh, yes. You see what happened to me. I mean, yeah. Internet connection is something that I paid uh, yeah. and, and I still pay. And I, and I could have, maybe I could have a better one if the institutions I work for uh, could pinch in, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but, but it's impossible. It's all the impossible. things we do. It's hard. It's hard. And, but it's mm-hmm. the amount that, uh, that educators do is really important. So, that's why I think it's important to think about how, how we're doing this, what, recognizing this amount of time that we put into being a professional educator, reflecting on it, and then optimizing it, not spending too much time in, in maybe mm-hmm. what's not optimal for us. And, well, and taking and care of ourselves down. too. Yes, taking care of ourselves. Right, Thanks, we don't do that. <laughs> We need to set boundaries and take care of ourselves. Like and take care of each and other. And I thought, that, yeah. And I keep thinking about this, like, like making the comparison between corporate life and and school life, and like, why am I able to sh- to close my computer and and in my own head say, okay, I can walk away. Mm-hmm. And and I guess it's because, like, when you're in the classroom, you have that classroom of students let's say there's 30 kids in there who are dependent on you. It's like all on those you. 30 people are immediately dependent on me. And no and one else is going to do it, Kate, just you. Exactly. And yep. I can't push a deadline, you know, for a lesson because no, that lesson, that class period is scheduled. Like, yeah, yeah. could I flub some things? You know, if I can't get, get things done in time sure I can have backup plans but I still have to be in front of those 30 people at that specific time and and it's not like it's just these are 30 random people that I don't care about it's these are people that I spend every day with for a set amount of time every day we have the relationship building and so now it's it's not just me thinking about the content, it's me thinking about the people who are experiencing yeah. this content. And and it requires, you know, so much more of like just thinking about their well being. So being yeah. an empathetic person and we're in the business of dealing with people, I couldn't as a teacher yeah. ever turn it off because I was the, always the, spinning. The tweets I see from teachers saying, For my own sanity, I should just quit but I can't during this pandemic because I'm teaching for these seniors who I've known for the last three or four years. And I'm like, I'm doing it for them. I'm going to stay in this for them. And it's so common. And that's yeah. and really interesting. It was last year when I was making the, de- or two years ago, I was making the decision. Wait, yeah. no. I've been with Edmodo a year. So yeah. yeah. Like, it was about two years ago, you were kind of thinking, thinking and, feeling it and then when I was given the offer part of it was like I seriously did think about the students that were coming yeah. yes, and this did. I was leaving I totally did I was You're like abandoning I don't know. Them. I yeah I did I, they were yeah, of course you did and then I went wait a second I need to take care of my my family I need to take care of me and the stress that I had that I was mm-hmm. carrying after 20 years of teaching, I was like, okay, I, I, I do need to, this to step away from my own health. And it, granted, timing wise, it happened before the yeah. pandemic. So I didn't feel super guilty walking away. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but now it's put me in a position though, where I do have the space and the skill set to help other teachers yeah. during this time period. You know, because otherwise, if I was still in the classroom, I'd be focused on just the students in front of me, and I wouldn't have that bandwidth to to help the greater educational community. And I like that point, because a lot of what we try to say about getting out there on Twitter or writing about what we're doing is about connecting and having a larger impact. 
not just uh, your classroom, but you know, affecting other teachers in the little ways that we can. Um, sometimes it's just motivating them. Sometimes it's just, you know, um, lifting them up. You know, I got a tweet from John Birdman type of um, experiences that, that do, they lift us up. And, and I'm sure all of us have done that and for other people. Um, and they've been really excited. Like June, who's not here today, has been here the other sessions. He was so happy to connect and be with us in these sessions um, and, and feeling good that he could connect to these other people that we, we have more experience than he has teaching because he's a young teacher. Um, so, and I think it's important for us to do that as well, to pay it forward. Yeah, that, that was me when I met you, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> when you were this young 22-year-old teacher, Adriana. No, I wasn't 22, <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it was I remember. like six, seven years ago. Six. Yeah. Six. Yeah. Uh, it, time flies. <laughs> so, closing thoughts, or, or what, what's your kind of message to um, to this group of educators? I really like um, that Kate's here because of. I, I think this is a good time for you to be here, not just because I'm looking for people to join us, but your perspective of being out of the classroom for that time and being in the classroom for many, many years too, I think is, um, it's really valuable. And I hope, I, I'm sure you realize that you've had time to reflect on that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, being a professional educator is, is, is multi-dimensional. Like you need to, yes, look at yourself and what is your persona that you're conveying to other people. Know, how do you present yourself? How do you improve your practice? Uh, that's all part of the professional experience. But it is also allowing others to see you as a professional uh, who are outside of the classroom space. You know, and again, this notion of being better together, that we don't teach in silos. We are not, we shouldn't be isolated in our own classrooms. We need to be together because as you know, the experts in the field, we're the ones that should be making the decisions on policy and we're the ones who should be, you know, being part of uh, solution generating when we're reacting to these We are professionals, but it's what we do and it's who we are. Yeah, that's good. And you have any final thoughts from you, Daniela and Adriana? Mm -hmm. I liked, of course, a lot of what Kate was saying. Um, and she adds to my workload already. <laughs> so we are, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, I, what I believe is that that's completely true. But, uh, the multidimensional aspect of, of being a professional educator. So it's learning at the same time of teaching, um, which takes time, effort, uh, money, investment, um, loads of things, uh, weekends, nights, um, any time, and particularly now in this context, but really it's, it's, a, it's a very demanding thing. Um, Multidimensional, completely, I completely agree, right. My friend Adriana. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I agree with, with both of you. Uh, Kate and Daniela and I will also add that um, we gotta stop uh, maybe I'm telling this more to myself than than, <laughs> than, than to you guys but um, we, got, we gotta stop uh, associating professionalism with uh, being infallible oh yeah uh, <laughs> yep I love that it's 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 like uh, like like a bad habit that we've been inheriting from generations that you have to be professional so you don't have to show with uh, weakness. Uh, mm -hmm. So being professional is admitting your mistakes and changing them along the way and being honest about it and and. Mm -hmm and negotiating with your students what's best for them and being open to to being a better teacher every day good 
Well, thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for connecting. And I'm glad your internet stayed up, Daniela. Um, this is good. This is, the, this is the fifth session. This is the end of the four pillars. Um, then the idea for the next week is, is those that are participating to think about how to apply FLIP in the context of their courses, whether it's I'm going to flip a whole class or I'm just going to flip a lesson. Um, I'm just going to keep thinking about flipping and I'm going to read about it more and wait and before I dip my toes in because I'm dealing with COVID and, and everything else is on fire, literally, <laughs> especially if you're on the West Coast. Um, <laughs> shout out and uh, hope my friends are okay. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing next week is talking about how to apply this to your situation. And then one more week is, is the wrap up and we're all done. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about it. I haven't been producing my videos. I had this series of tech edu tips in Spanish three times a week as publishing little ones. But I was kind of running out of ideas. So I was getting tired. Um, and then I used OpenFlip as an excuse of I'm not going to make these videos while I'm doing this. And so um, I'm getting all these ideas to, to recharge and do that little project again once this is over. So it's it's been flying by and thank you all for being involved. Thank you for creating Good this night. space. Good night, internet. And I'll hit my stop <laughs> record button. For the three people that are going to watch this. <laughs>